Art and Ralph, is it, or, would you like to start? No, go right ahead. I'm okay. Time Thank, to go. You. Thank you. Well, good, good afternoon, everybody. I am Barbara Omstrux, and on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Central Delaware County, a hearty welcome and thank you for joining us today for a hot topic discussion on the national popular vote interstate compact in Pennsylvania. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan civic organization committed to promoting political responsibility through informed and active participation in government, citizenship and elections. A National League Task Force was established in 2019 to explore and evaluate State League support for the Interstate Compact. Findings demonstrated a significant amount of interest and support within State Leagues and a need to provide current information and valuable educational resources for members to support the Interstate Compact. LWV believes that the direct popular vote method for electing the president and the vice president is essential to representative government. LWV supports the national popular vote interstate compact as a way to achieve a true majority vote until the electoral college can be overturned. The speaker today, state representative Chris Rabb introduced legislation in November 2020 to pass the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact in Pennsylvania. Chris is joined by Brett Dolente, a member of the LWVPA advocacy team who will speak about the league's position on the compact. We have received many of your excellent questions prior and these were shared with the speakers prior to the meeting. Please utilize the chat function and ask any additional questions. We also ask you to mute yourself during the presentation. We are recording this event and a link to the recording will be sent to you to all those who registered for this program. And the recorded program will also be available on our website. Now, just for a quick look ahead for some programming to come in April by the LWV CDC chapter. Join us for an annual environmental program on April 15th at 7 p.m. with Roberta Winters, president of the League of Women Voters of Radnor Township and an active environmentalist. Roberta will review the difference between natural gas liquids and liquefied natural gas and share with you their associated risks and benefits. Roberta will provide an update on the Logistics Center, a new site for natural gas liquid storage and transport via the Delaware River. All members of LWV CDC are invited to the annual meeting on May 27th by Zoom. Please register for this program on our website to, rece to receive the Zoom link. At this meeting, we will vote for a new slate of officers and board members and confirm the 2021-2022 budget, our local program priorities and proposed changes to the bylaws. We invite all members to participate and your participation will help us achieve a voting quorum. Many thanks to league members, Ann Masakowski, Jane Brennan, Kathy Youngman and Ralph Graves for their help in organizing this program today. And please join me in welcoming Chris Rabb and Brent Dolente. We will first show a brief video to introduce you to the background about the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact and answer some of the questions that you may have on the subject. Jane will then follow and introduce our speakers. We hope you enjoyed this program today and uh, learn about this important topic. Thank you. We're ready for the video. Former presidential candidate Scott Walker summed up our current system of electing the president by saying, the nation as a whole is not gonna elect the next president. 12 states are. Governor Mitt Romney said, and so all, all the money will get spent in 10 states. 
This video explains why more than three quarters of the people of the United States are politically irrelevant in general election campaigns for president and how that can be changed in order to make every voter in every state relevant in every presidential election. The National Popular Vote Bill would guarantee the presidency to the candidate receiving the most popular votes in all 50 states in the District of Columbia. The President of the United States is elected by 538 presidential electors. The Constitution lets each state choose the method of selecting its electors. Today, 48 states use the so-called winner-take-all law that awards all of a state's presidential electors to the candidate who gets the most popular votes inside each separate state. For example, because Obama received a million and a half votes in Minnesota, and Romney got only a million three, all 10 of Minnesota's electoral votes for president were cast by Democratic electors. Because of state winner-take-all laws, five of our 45 presidents have come into office without receiving the most popular votes nationwide. This occurs when a candidate wins a couple of states by a small margin while losing the rest of the country by a large margin. For example, in 2016, President Trump won Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania by a total of 78,000 votes, thereby winning a majority in the Electoral College while losing the country by 2.8 million votes. Each of these 78,000 voters was 36 times more important than the 2.8 million voters elsewhere. Similarly, 537 voters in Florida in 2000 were 1,000 times more important than 537,000 voters elsewhere in the country. Near misses are common under the current system. A shift of 60,000 votes in Ohio in 2004 would have elected the second place candidate despite President George W. Bush's nationwide lead of 3 million votes. Because a few thousand votes in any one of a dozen closely divided battleground states can decide the presidency, the winner-take-all system repeatedly creates unnecessary controversies and crises, even when the choice of the nation's 140 million voters is clear. Moreover, the outsized national impact of a few thousand votes in battleground states virtually invites foreign interference in our elections. In a nationwide vote for president, every vote will be equal throughout the country. State winner-take-all laws have other adverse effects. Neither candidate has any reason to campaign in any state where he is safely ahead or hopelessly behind. For example, the only states that received any general election campaign events in 2012 were the 12 states where Romney's support was in the narrow range between 45 percent and 51 percent. 38 states were ignored, including 12 of the 13 smallest states and almost all rural, agricultural, southern, western, and northeastern states. 23 reliably Republican states were totally ignored by both parties, as were 15 Democratic states in the District of Columbia. In 2016, virtually all general election campaign events were in 12 closely divided states where Trump support was between 43 percent and 51 percent. Similarly, in 2008, virtually all campaigning was in 14 closely divided states. But there's more at stake than whether babies don't get kissed in the states that get ignored. In his book, Presidential Pork, Dr. John Hudak of the Brookings Institution documents how battleground states receive 7% more presidentially controlled grants, twice as many disaster declarations, and considerably more Superfund and No Child Left Behind exemptions. The Small Business Administration's largest loan in history was to a ricotta cheese factory, described by President Obama as, quote, the tastiest investment the government has ever made, unquote, located in, you guessed it, Ohio. Meanwhile, Professors Douglas Kreiner and Andrew Reeves show how the interests of battleground states shape innumerable government policies, including steel quotas imposed by the free trade president from the free trade party, even travel by sitting presidents and cabinet members is skewed to battleground states. Indeed, flyover states are so irrelevant that presidential candidates don't even bother polling them 
to see what issues might be of concern to their voters. As a former White House press secretary said, quote, if people don't like it, they can move from a safe state to a swing state. Fortunately, thanks to the National Popular Vote Bill, people don't have to move to another state in order to make their vote count. The cause of all these problems, namely the state-by-state, winner-take-all method of choosing presidential electors, is not in the Constitution. It was not debated at the Constitutional Convention and was never mentioned in the Federalist Papers. Only three states used winner-take-all in our nation's first presidential election in 1789, and all three repealed it by 1800. It was not till 1880 that winner-take-all was adopted by all the states. These state winner-take-all laws can be repealed in the same way that they were originally enacted, namely by passing a different state law. In the leading case governing the selection of presidential electors, the U.S. Supreme Court has ruled that the choice of method belongs exclusively to the states. As of 2020, 15 states and the District of Columbia have enacted the National Popular Vote Bill into law, including four small states, eight medium-sized states, and three big states. Moreover, one legislative chamber has approved the bill in nine other states, including a bipartisan 28-18 to 18 vote in the Republican-controlled Oklahoma Senate and a bipartisan 37-21 to 21 vote in the Republican-controlled Arizona House. The national popular vote law will take effect when identical laws are enacted by states possessing a majority of the Electoral College, that is 270 out of 538. After taking effect, every vote will be equal throughout the United States, thus making every voter in every state politically relevant in every presidential election. All of the presidential electors from the enacting states will be supporters of the candidate receiving the most popular votes in all 50 states and D.C., thereby guaranteeing the presidency to the candidate receiving the most popular votes nationwide. In a nationwide election in which every vote is equal, candidates will have to pay attention to the concerns of voters in all 50 states. The National Popular Vote Compact is a constitutionally conservative, state-based approach. It does not alter the Constitution and does not violate the Constitution. It retains the Electoral College and state control of elections. Additional videos discuss various specific aspects of the National Popular Vote Compact. Learn more at nationalpopularvote.com and from the book, Every Vote Equal, a state-based plan for electing the president by national popular vote, which can be read or downloaded for free or purchased from Amazon. Please use our convenient email system to ask your state legislators to support the national popular vote bill. Um, it is my pleasure now to welcome our speakers for today's program. Pennsylvania State Representative Chris Rabb is a father, an educator, an author, and a social justice activist. He has taught in social entrepreneurship and organizational innovation. Putting his teaching expertise into action, he helped to successfully unionize 1,500 fellow adjunct professors at Temple in a landslide victory for workers' rights. Representative Rabb has a broad background in research, teaching, journalistic ethics, innovation, and policymaking. He is a thought leader at the intersection of politics, media entrepreneurship, and social identity. In addition to his extensive areas of expertise, Representative Rabb has long been involved in a variety of community activities. He is a, an avid family historian and genealogist. His interest in journalism can be traced to his great-great-grandfather, who founded the Baltimore Afro-American newspaper in 1892. Representative Rabb introduced legislation in November 2020 to pass the Nat National Popular Vote Interstate Compact in Pennsylvania. Um, the compact has already been approved, as said, by 11 states in the District of Columbia and currently has 165 votes of approval and needs 105 more. Um, Brett Dolente, a member of the League of Women Voters of Pennsylvania Ag Ad Advocacy Group, hmm, 
will speak about the League's position on the compact. She has been an enthusiastic member of the Chester County League of Women Voters, having been drawn into the League through Carol Cunaholm of Fair Districts, PA. Brett has been actively involved in voter registration activities and in obtaining signatures for Fair Districts PA petitions. A former large animal veterinarian, she now volunteers as part of a riding program for handicapped children and adults. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. It's great to be part of this uh, virtual event. And good to see you, Brett. Yes, good to see you too. <laughs> um, I, I, I want to thank you for uh, inviting me to speak. Uh, this is a particularly important piece of legislation to me because it was the very first piece of legislation um, I introduced as a, a new member of the Pennsylvania General Assembly um, in December of 2016. Um, I know this is a nonpartisan um, organization and I respect that and I don't really uh, see myself much as a partisan, but I have to tell you, um, the it, night I won me, was the same it, night. What's um, that? Representative Rob, your camera is not uh, showing up in our recording. Oh, let's see. I see me and I see all of you. Let me see if this works. Hold on. We don't see you. There you go. Yes. Thank oh, you. Well, you weren't missing much. <laughs> we, we but could you your audio we got your audio but not the video okay wonderful mm -hmm. well uh, uh, as i was saying uh this piece of legislation was the very first piece um, of legislation i introduced uh, as a new member um in december of 2016 so you may recall that election perhaps i don't know if you do november of 2016 um, it was the night my, my children uh, were crying. They were not screaming with joy because daddy won, um, uh, but for other reasons. Um, and so I came into uh, the legislature, which is the largest full-time legislature in the country, um, not knowing what I could do um, in, in light of what happened um, uh, on that fateful night. And as a result, um, I decided that irrespective of how many numbers I had with similar political ideology, that I would do what was right and who was in my heart and do substantive legislation that benefited our society and our commonwealth. And this is what I started with. Um, and I have uh, reintroduced it. Um, and when I reintroduced it this term, I brought nine of my friends along with me. So I am the proud co-prime sponsor um, along with, um, uh, I just want to give a, a shout out so you all know who else is uh, behind this. Uh, Representatives Briggs, Fiedler, Hohenstein, Isaacson, Kenyatta, Kincaid, Lee, Sanchez, and Sterla. So they are all co-prime sponsors, which means that um, they can take as much credit as, as I can for introducing this. The difference between a co-prime sponsor and a co-sponsor is um, it's kind of a term of art, but I think it's important for you all to know if you don't already. Um, Co-primes are the folks who have their names in the co-sponsorship memo, which is a public document um, forecasting legislation to come. And uh, co-primes are those, uh, the names of legislators um, who are seeking to introduce a specific piece of legislation. A co-sponsor is someone who signs on to someone else's piece of legislation. Um, so that is a, um, an important distinction that is, is rarely made, but I think it's important because that means that you can go to these nine other legislators and, and who have skin in the game because their names are associated with the uh, prospective introduction of the bill with their name on it. Um, and so I wanted to introduce this and I've had constituents and folks from across the state and beyond the state to get me to reintroduce it. And uh, I was glad that I was able to do so. And I had a press conference of two. I included that, the YouTube link into the chat um, where I had the uh, former uh, chair of the, of the Michigan Republican party come out and support this. I couldn't find any Republicans in Pennsylvania 
but I had to import one from Michigan to prove that this is truly a bipartisan and more importantly, a nonpartisan issue. Um, and uh, was glad to do that. I did reach out to some Republican colleagues who had supported it in a previous iteration in the past. They have, um, the ones who I was able to talk to have changed their tune and I suspect um, you will be more influential in changing their tune back than I, uh, and I will help you in any way I can. But um, listen, um, <laughs> you know, we often uh, uh, are ending an election night saying, oh, I, I wish my candidate had won. But I don't know how many of us say, I wish my candidate had won if we had better rigged the system. <laughs> or we had, I just, I, I don't know anyone like that. My next door neighbor is a Republican. I know she would never say that. I don't know any of my Democratic uh, friends or anyone who I hold in any regard who would say such a thing. That's deeply problematic. Anyone who truly embraces a participatory mm -hmm. democracy, um, uh, would would feel shamed to say such things. We want to win fair and square, and this levels the playing field. And uh, just like the the masterful video um, that we saw, there's only a few few states that actually get considered uh, by major uh, presidential candidates, um, and that will remain the case. One colleague who will remain nameless said, "Well, you know, if this." interstate compact is enacted, well then, you know, they're not gonna to come to Pennsylvania as much. And I'm thinking, should we really legislate by, by ego? Oh, that we get maybe incrementally fewer visits from presidential candidates? <clears throat> I, 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 don't, I don't get that as a rationale for not supporting something that strengthens our, particip our participatory democracy. And, you know, we love to say that we are the beacon of democracy and we are the oldest uh, democracy um, uh, on the face of the planet. And yet when everybody looks to our constitution, our founding documents, mm -hmm. there's not a single country that says, yeah, let's hold on to that electoral college too. That's, <laughs> that's genius. Yeah, we want an intermediary body to, <laughs> to, to keep, you know, uh, voters from actually deciding who is going to be our, our next president. That's what we need. We haven't seen that for good reason, right? There are things that we like about our Constitution, and there are things we don't like. And we seek to amend those things to the, to the extent we can. Um, and uh, we try to work around those things, which is, in this case is the um, morally appropriate um, and reasonable thing to do. This bypasses the electoral college. There's nothing illegal or unethical about it. Um, as mentioned in the video, um, this is being creative. And you heard from my background, I'm really into civic innovation. This is a very innovative piece of legislation that is highly collaborative and uh, nonpartisan in nature. And I love it. And the original, which wasn't mentioned in the video, was that the original um, promulgators uh, of this legislation were Republicans. I'm okay with that as a Democrat. I don't care where it came from. I care about its impact. I care about the outcomes and how it benefits society as a whole and our commonwealth. And this does not play favorites based on uh, political affiliation. And that's a good thing. Um, most of my ancestors were Republicans. It would have been absurd for my ancestors, all of whom were African-American, um, to be a part of the Democratic Party. <laughs> People would just laugh them out of their, <laughs> their community. Um, things change, party affiliations change. Uh, that's, that's kind of the norm. That shouldn't impact what we're talking about here. This transcends partisanship. This is about fairness and meaningful representation. So, okay, I'm gonna stop with my, uh, my speech and, <laughs> and, and entertain questions or pass it to, to Brett. Um, but I, I just wanted to give you some context for um, why this is so important and why it's so important to me as a legislator. Um, the first question that we received um, prior to the, this presentation is what are the chances that this could become real? I'm going to put it about 100%. It's not a matter of if. It's a matter of when and which states will step up next. We're 70% there. Uh, Pennsylvania would be a great coup. We are the 
cradle of liberty, right? So it would be appropriate for us to get on board. So we need to get at least 207, we need to get all the states that have it, that combined have at least 270 electoral votes. Um, so I don't know exactly what number we're at right now, but um, uh, we're, we're, we're getting there. Is Pennsylvania the most likely uh, state to adopt this next? We are not. Uh, that's, that's one of the reasons I wanna be I'm on this call with you because I need your help. And you are a um, highly esteemed brand. You have a reputation that is respected on both sides of the aisle. You know how to organize you know how to influence appropriately. And uh, no one, and I just learned this from my grand folks, but you know, no one does it alone. All the important stuff, it's, it's a collaborative effort and it's an inside outside game. Mm. Those of us on the inside who are doing what we can, but you all actually can, can be at least as influential on my colleagues than I can. Um, particularly for all of you who um, come from districts uh, represented by members who are not yet on board. They're gonna to listen to you um, incre at least incrementally more than they'll listen to me because I can vote for them. I don't have the same influence um, that, that folks on the ground do. That really matters. That really, really matters. Um, so yes, it will happen. Um, it is likely to happen. Um, I just don't know when. I. Um, um, I, I would love to say that Pennsylvania is next, but we're probably a couple of years off, but hopefully other states will step up in the interim so that we are just uh, the, the cherry on the, uh, uh, <laughs> on the hot fudge uh, uh, banana split. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we had a question from, on the chat about how many states have approved it. Um, and how many, or how many votes and how many more do we need? I know you said you weren't quite sure. On our uh, page, we said 165 votes we've had and 105 more are needed. Does that sound about right? Say that again. I wanna make sure I, I heard that. 165 correctly. votes have already been um, with other states, 11 oh. states plus the um, District of Columbia and that we another 105 votes are needed in order to meet the magic 270? Uh, we're, at, we're at 196. Um, Eileen Reeve just added 15 states plus DC with 196. So, okay. And, Thanks, Rod. Okay, thank you. So that um, only five or six additional needed. Wow. I'm sorry, was there, was there another question? Um, I, I didn't yes. Um, why do the participating states have to wait until there are enough states to total 270 electoral votes before they can implement the program in their own state? Because it has no, it, it, it doesn't have the power to do anything until the majority of the electoral votes um, can be controlled by those states in that interstate compact. So it, it, it doesn't take, it can't be enforced until you have everyone you need, until you have all the states that add up to at least 270. So um, it, there would be no authority to an interstate compact if it doesn't surpass that threshold um, of 270. Uh, okay, um, and we have a question is it possible to create a national primary election day? I mean, sure, that's that's unrelated to this. And I would love to get into uh, other um, uh, voting rights and election reforms, campaign reforms that you all are interested in after we address this issue, but um, that is a that is an entirely separate thing. So if, if there's time afterwards and you wanna talk about any other uh, legislation in this general area. I'd love to do that because I've introduced a bunch of stuff that I would love your support on too. But in the interest of this particular legislation, that's um, there's no direct connection um, to it. We also had a question. Um, if once the compact becomes operational, if a member state's political party power changes, 
Uh, could that state withdraw from the compact and thus render it non-functioning? Unfortunately, yes. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> which, which is why the ch how we frame the narrative around doing this is so important. Why? Because um, you could frame this in a very bad and partisan way, which I don't recommend, or you can frame this around democracy and inclusion and fairness um, and the, you know, the, the, the best of our espoused collective values mm -hmm. such that any politician who feels that this is not going to go his or her way on behalf of their party, that the, the will of the people will have uh, been documented because the narrative is so strong saying this is not about a particular party or a particular state or a particular candidate, this is about democracy itself. And it'll be much harder for that um, cynical politician to try to introduce legislation to pull us from that interstate compact. And what I found is things that have been controversial and, um, uh, uh, and yet still pass and are enacted into law that actually help people when it's all said and done just factually, Folks don't want to give up those rights and opportunities and resources. So all the folks who said oh, Obamacare is socialistic, no one's trying to give up all the most important things that they've benefited from that they never had before. So I believe, uh, and that's just one example, and you could do it, you know, you could choose any number of things. Social security. There's a lot of people who thought social security was a form of socialism. I don't know a single um, uh, right-wing uh, uh, conservative colleague of mine um, who would give up their social security check. I just don't. <laughs> Jane, I don't know if you can see that um, someone has their hand up to ask no, a question. No, I can't. Um, Jack Nagel, do you want to unmute yourself and ask a question? Yeah, actually, it's not a question, but about the previous question. Uh, I believe, and uh, Representative Rob uh, can correct me if I'm wrong, but that the bill contains a provision that a state cannot, that has joined the pact, cannot withdraw within six months of the end of a presidential term. So that means at the height of the campaign and after the result was known, uh, the state can't withdraw until a new president is inaugurated. After that, it could pull out, uh, but that is a, a safety protection against the problem of, of you know, seeing the uh, way the winds were blowing and, and a party wanting to get out of it. That's true. I thank you for that, um, uh, um, for adding that. That's absolutely accurate. So even though you can uh, remove a state from the interstate compact, um, there are requirements for how you do that to and have that safety provision as Mr. Nagel uh, referenced. So thank you. Which is a, an important you know, feature of this legislation because we have to foresee the political machinations that could be afoot. Um, we have another question about um, what are your prospects for getting your bill out of committee for a vote this year? Well, I'm going to turn that back on you. Uh, what are you all prepared to do to help me? <laughs> so <laughs> that I listen, I, I, I say that in jest, but I, I'm also saying that in terms of what is our uh, strategic approach to making progress on this. So let me be let me be very blunt here. So last legislative term, I think there was roughly 3,000 bills that were circulated. Not all of them were introduced, but circulated for our consideration. 3,000. Um, the ones that were introduced, let's reduce that down to 2,000. So ones that had bill numbers attached to them. So they were formally introduced. The Speaker of the House determines where those bills are referred, which of the various standing committees that bill should go to. Um, well, who decides the bills that are referred to their committee, uh, to a given committee, who decides what bills actually are considered for a vote or for a hearing or for an informational meeting? Um, who is that person? This is, this is the quiz portion of my presentation. This is really important. So if, if you know, put it in the chat. If you don't know, make a good guess. There are no, there are no stupid questions or answers here. But this is really, really important to, to respond to the question of, you know, what is the likelihood that this 
uh, moves forward and gets considered a committee. All right. So um, Ralph says, chair of the committee, be more specific, please. Because every standing committee. So the committees are chaired by whoever has the majority party. So the committee chair is going to be of the majority party and they're gonna decide what gets out of committee. Um, so that's, that is, uh, the spirit of your answer is true. The, the specifically though, there are two chairs. There's the majority chair and the minority chair. And in our state legislature, only the majority chair has power. The minority chair, it is an honorific at best. <laughs> so the majority chair of the two chairs is the one who decides what bills, if there's a hundred bills referred to her committee, she can say, I'm only running 50 and 49 of them are introduced by people of her party. That is the norm for, um, I believe decades um, in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives. So the vast majority of bills that um, are referred, well, are um, in committee that are actually voted on overwhelmingly are Republican, are bills introduced by Republicans. And about 99% of those bills that are voted on are passed. So getting over the hump of having a, um, a bill that's not introduced by a Republican um, into committee and actually gaining um, the votes needed to get out of committee is a Herculean feat. So in Pennsylvania, as of this, this last legislative term or current term, they amended the House rules to make put even more folks from the majority party in standing committees. Actually, they did that in 2018 when there was something called the blue tsunami. And um, so even though it was more proportionate in terms of number of Democrats and Republicans in the House of Representatives, they made the, the a disproportionate amount of folks in the majority party on committees, which meant it was harder for any bill introduced by someone in the majority party to come out of committee. So now we have 15 members of the majority party on every standing committee and 10 when before it was 14 and 11. Um, I found that deeply um, unfair. And I would say the same thing if Democrats were in charge. Uh, fair is fair. So that means you need 13 votes to get this bill and any bill out of committee. So as that would stand, if it's a Democratic bill and Democrats like it, you get 10 Democrats, you need three Republicans to to defect. Um, and that's probably the most likely combination. Although I have to tell you, there are Democratic colleagues of mine who are not supportive of my bill, largely because they haven't taken the time to read it and understand how it works. I think some folks think it's something entirely different than what it is. And um, if they heard from Republicans who support it, um, that might have a bigger influence um, than some of fellow Democrats. That's just my guess. Um, so that's the architecture and the process for what you all are going to have to help me do on the grassroots level. You need to help me find, and I believe, let me just pull it up, um, that it's referred to, oh, it hasn't been referred to a committee yet because technically um, the bill has not been introduced. I've reserved a bill number, HB 270. Uh, in honor of the 270 electoral votes. Um, so it has not formally been introduced when it is, it almost certainly will be referred to the state government committee, which um, is uh, chaired by um, Seth Grove. Nice guy, um, very different politics than, than, than mine, but I think he's a decent fellow who might be persuaded into having a hearing on this. And again, your goal is only convincing three Republicans and any on this committee and um, the 10 Democrats. That's a wonderful lead in to um, what the League of Women Voters can do. And so, Brett, yeah. Brett it's, uh, we'll ask you what 
uh, League of Women Voters of Pennsylvania is recommending. Can I talk for my five minutes? Yeah, indeed. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, uh, as you know, my name is Brett Delenti. I am a lifelong resident of Chester County, Pennsylvania, which is in the southeast corner of the state, leaving only for education. I attended Vassar College in Poughkeepsie, New York and continued my education at the University of Pennsylvania School of Veterinary Medicine. I currently am retired and live on campus at New Bolton Center in Kennett Square. In my Advid love of the League of Women Voters, I have found it really helpful to look at the five steps the League uses to enhance, sorry, to achieve its mission statement, its mission goals. So one is to identify a problem. Two is discuss the problem, look at pros and cons, including a various solutions to the problem. Third is to form a democratic consensus to resolve that problem. And fourth, is something we all know the league for. They phone bank, they get petitions signed, they educate the public. They also lobby. And if the position is not, if the problem is not solved, they can go on to litigate. So I know this was said before, but I'm gonna say it again. In 1970, January, 1970, the League of Women Voters of the United States believes that the direct popular vote method for election of the president and vice president is essential to representative government. The League of Women Voters believes therefore that the Electoral College should be abolished. When I first read this statement, I was overwhelmed with admiration and awe repeatedly for the League of Women Voters. Without digital population data, which we have today, without all the information we see in the, the videos that the compact can provide, these women did this. I'm so impressed with them. Um, now, because of the compact videos, it is very easy for us to, ed to be part of educating the public on the weaknesses of the Electoral College. So that was step three when they got this position made and they did not stop there. Uh, in 1971, with the League of Women Voters help in, regarding phone banking, petition signing and educating the public, an amendment was passed by the House of Representatives to abolish the Electoral College, and it nearly passed the Senate. Since then, every Congress has seen this bill. It has been there and it has not moved forward. But again, the League had not been quiet. In 1997, they again testified before Congress, pointing out the, the problems with the current system for electing our president. They did this again in 2001. So the league has not, they made the position in 1970. They did not disappear. They have continued with this position. In 2010, the League of Women Voters endorsed the compact, the National Population Popular Vote Interstate Compact. And where the league is today, the League of Women Voters supports one position with two parts, abolition of the electoral college and support of the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. I share here this biennial document the League produces, which is essentially my Bible, which tells me where the League's stands are currently regarding its, its positions. So the League supports this compact and has it has across the country and helps in any way they can to, to get it passed until we can abolish the Electoral College. Thank you. So are there specific um, actions that the Pennsylvania League is recommending? Well, as a member, again, with every, every county, I can contact and other League members will contact their representatives to be co-sponsors of this bill. Okay. It, I guess I'm not really sure from Representative Rab, are we there yet? Can I? Can I start doing that now or do we need to wait for that bill to go farther? No, I made sure, and first thank you um, for, for your presentation. That was very, very moving. Um, I, I always like the history. Um, 
So that was, that was very inspiring. And I appreciate your work, your leadership, and, um, and all of you who, who've joined today. So yes, because I've reserved the bill number, um, you're, you're good to go, right? But here's the other thing I want you all to know. And this is, when I, when I agree to do stuff like this, I never like wasting your time because I never like wasting my time. And so I want to share um, an insider uh, piece of information. And I, it's really important. And it's very cynical. Not, not, I'm not saying it in a cynical way. I'm acknowledging a cynicism that you need to be aware of that may not be obvious. One is you're going to encounter some of my colleagues who sign on to a bill that they don't particularly care for just so you stop calling them. <laughs> I found that out the hard way after I was elected, that I have colleagues who will sign on to a bill, maybe to impress their daughter or to get the most vocal people in their community, folks like you, from leaving, just to leave them alone. And you need to be very, this is where you need your emotional intelligence antenna to be like seriously working because if they're voting for other things, that seem to be contradictory to the spirit of this bill, that's, that's a yellow flag. If um, they avoid you after they've signed onto the bill, um, that's probably a yellow flag. If they say anything on social media or press conferences or, or, or press statements, or house floors uh, um, remarks that seem to go against um, the the impetus behind this or or other legislation that you support, that's a that's a yellow flag if not a red flag, um, and you need to make a mark by that person's name because if they've done it to you for this bill, they've done it to other bills that you may care about, and that means that they're not necessarily the allies you think they've become because they've added their name. The other thing that you have to understand too is this could get a hundred co-sponsors, it could get 200 co-sponsors and never see the light of day. I'll give you an example. For those of you who support um, LGBTQ rights, you just believe that they should no longer be second class citizens in Pennsylvania, which they are, which they are under state law. And you say, no, um, every human being deserves dignity and they should all be created equal know that the most popularly co-sponsored bill for years has been the LGBTQ equality bill uh, introduced uh, every term by Representative Dan Frankel of Pittsburgh. That bill has not moved since day one. It has a ton of Republican co-sponsors, a ton of Democratic co-sponsors. It has not moved anywhere. Why has it not moved anywhere? Because in this day and age, no one wants to look like a rabbit bigot. So they get you to go away because, hey, look, I co-sponsored it. I'm one of the good guys. And then quietly they tell their leadership, please, please, please don't let this bill come up for a vote because my true blue supporters who do not support LGBTQ rights are going to come at me and they're going to primary me in the next uh, election cycle. That is the reality that you all have to understand every time you write a postcard, you make a phone call, you send an email, you post something on social media. That is the reality. You need to know the folks who are really convinced that this is the right way to go, and then the folks who are just cynical who want you to go away, the folks who are on the fence, the folks who are opposed because they're clueless, they haven't read the bill, and the folks who have read the bill and for whatever reason strongly disagree. You got at least five different categories and you, you need to know where each member um, sits. The second thing you need to know, and I put this in the, I like being helpful, I like actionable information. I don't like wasting people's time. time. So I put in there a link to, here are the 15 most important uh, Republicans to persuade. Who are those 15 people? It's not by accident. It's the 15 people on the state government committee where assuredly my bill will be referred uh, when it's formally introduced. Um, those 15, Democrat, uh, 15 Republicans and the 10 Democrats um, who are on that committee are the ones who are going to vote on it if it ever comes up for a vote. You just need three if you can get all 10 Democrats. I'm not certain you can get all 10 Democrats. Which of the 10 Democrats is the most important person on there? This is another quiz. The all, not all created equal. Who's that? The minority chair. 
That's right, the minority chair. Why is the minority chair the most important Democrat? Because she um, is going to make a recommendation for how her fellow Democrats should vote in committee. It is not in the best interest of the other nine Democrats to oppose her on something she feels strongly about because she's the person who will likely negotiate with her Republican counterpart on democratic bills that they want to run in committee and if you don't support your own chair any bill that you want to run out of that committee they're going to be less likely to to go to bat for you if you if you don't support something that is meaningful to her so if you don't have margo davidson on board um then you know what you need to do now there is at least one member of state government who is a co-prime sponsor that's Malcolm Kenyatta. So you can have you can have a meeting where you say, um, can we have him talk to her with or without you, or one or both, um, and anyone else who's um, who's um, named on the bill. So you have that going for you. And then you also you also can look at the voting record of any of the fifteen Republicans to see what other bills have they voted on that may have departed from other Republican counterparts and say, look, you voted this way on this bill, which we support this, 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 here's another bill that you should really like. So there's a lot of research that can be done before you reach out to, um, to various members. They're not all created equal. The most important one is Seth Grove because he's the majority chair. And like I said, he couldn't be further. Uh, he couldn't be further on the other side of the political spectrum um, than me. But I like the guy. He's a decent person. You can. He is someone you can talk to. I cannot say that for all of my colleagues, Democrat or Republican. So this is not an issue of ideology or partisanship. This means that his personality. He's friendly. He's down to earth. Um, he is open to hearing things that he may not agree with. I have colleagues who walk the other way uh, if you embrace a certain view. So that's a good and tactical piece of information for you. He's okay. a decent person. May I um, interrupt you? We have a couple of questions from the audience. Laura Lavin, um, can you unmute Laura? Laura, you're muted. Okay. Um, yes, I've, I've had my hand up for a while. My uh, apologies. And, uh, but I was glad uh, for you to uh, outline the, a lot of the um, uh, things that we kind of research that uh, we really need to be doing in the background before we uh, actually approach our legislators. And uh, I also want to point out that uh, Margot Davidson uh, is a um, a Democratic uh, legislator from Delaware County, so um, which is the county we live in, and uh, so we uh, probably would be uh, interviewing her at some point when we do our legislative interviews. Um, and uh, I uh, actually, the uh, other comment that I wanted to make on strategy uh, is that the the majority leader is, of course, an important person. And as you pointed out, uh, if, um, if uh, legislators sign on to a bill, uh, they can be um, approaching the majority leader and saying, I'm on this bill, but please don't let it see the light of day. And that, that's what happened to us uh, when we um, uh, had a 98 co-sponsors of our redistricting reform legislation. Uh, uh, we always talked about this has 98 course co-sponsors, but in the background, we knew, uh, those of us didn't know anyway, knew what was going on, uh, that the majority leader had been told, don't let, let this bill get out. Uh, I also have some, uh, was uh, happy that Jack Nagel was on the, um, uh, on this call, uh, because uh, he is a, a professor of political science, a retired professor of political science, and knows quite a bit about uh, a lot of um, uh, electoral form, reform 
uh, strategies, particularly surrounding the uh, uh, <laughs> getting uh, bills that would uh, actually reflect um, the uh, will of the majority of the people. Of course, national popular vote is one of them. And um, uh, I, uh, I actually was uh, uh, the um, member of the league that uh, on the state board at the time that the uh, Pennsylvania League decided to um, support the national popular vote bill. I, would, I brought that up to our, one of our state conventions and got our members to, um, uh, to uh, uh, approve that. And uh, I've got some other uh, proposals in the back of my mind uh, that I would hope that someday we would be able to find sponsors for like you, Representative Rab, uh, like um, uh, ranked choice voting. That's my bill. <laughs> Good, I'm glad you've got that bill. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so uh, 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 maybe you can mention the uh, bill number, I'll look it up. Okay. And, uh, we also have, uh, I know this is a getting off the subject, but uh, Jack Nagel also has a, um, an interesting proposal for ensuring that the um, state, le state legislature would uh, represent the majority of the voters in Pennsylvania. So, thank, thank you, Laura. We also have a question from Alicia. Can you unmute Alicia, Kathy? Alicia, Alicia, are you there? I tried. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> All right, um, I didn't really have a question. I just did that by mistake. But thank you for this presentation and I'll look up more um, information. I came in late, so I wanted to see whether the local uh, representatives and the local senators here are supporting this uh, proposal um, for the well, national popular vote. And I don't know, is there like a, just a place to look to see who's supporting it? So thank you, Alicia. So even though you didn't intend to ask a question, you raised something that's super important um, that relates to the work you all will do on the grassroots level. So if there is a bill that is circulated in, in, form, in the form of a co-sponsorship memo, and I sent you a link, um, I've sent you a lot of links, so you have to, I'm a nerd. You'll have to excuse me, but I like giving you all information. So you're not all reliant upon me in this one moment. You have more information you can process. There is a link and it might be the first or uh, maybe it's the, the fourth link I sent around um, uh, 1207. Um, it is a link to all of my legislation this term. If it doesn't have a bill number next to it, means it hasn't been introduced yet. But I also am able to reserve a number in, in uh, anticipation of introducing it. So like this bill, I reserve the bill number HB 270 because that's a special number, 270 electoral votes, right? Um, why does that matter? If you reach out to your, your state rep, say rep, Davidson and say, we want you to co-sponsor this bill. And she says, okay, and she does, um, then she will have her name listed as one of the co-sponsors. But as soon as I introduce the bill and there's a bill number next to it, and you go to another state rep and say, we want you to co-sponsor the bill, and they do, their name is not going to be listed explicitly, even though they are just as much a co-sponsor as some of the earlier ones before it has been introduced. Does that make sense? Because it's a really important distinction. Because what I don't want you to do is say, hey, you're not a co-sponsor. I don't see your name. You said you would. Da, da, da. It doesn't, unfortunately, it doesn't work that way uh, where you can see, um, give public access to all the people who've co-sponsored a bill, including those after the bill has been introduced. Now, where can you get that information? Um, well, now that you know me, you can get it from me. And because I'm interested in all of the aggressively fabulous bills you're interested in too, almost certainly, or the overwhelming uh, number of bills we, we agree on, you can use me and my office specifically um, 
to get inside information. All on the up and up, what I mean by inside information is information that is not easily accessible to the public. You have direct access to me. Now, I know I may not be your state rep, but I am a state lawmaker. So I believe I represent your interests um, broadly. So you can reach out to me um, and I'm gonna put my information in the chat so that you can get more information about a specific bill. You can say, tell us, can you send us a list of the, of the latest co-sponsors? That's gonna be really important to you. So you don't waste your time reaching out to people who are already on board, right? Um, you may ask us, and I recommend you do ask us for information on the 15 Republican members or the 10 Democratic members of the state government committee. Um, so you know who to reach first. Right. So and how to reach them. Say, OK, well, what are the voting records? What, what what do we need to know to influence our approach when we reach out to them? And I, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm super unique in this, but I respond very well to flattery. I'm a very unique man, you know. Um, so if you if you approach someone by saying, I really like your votes on this, that and the other, I like what you did in introducing this bill or this resolution, I liked your remarks on this, that, or the other, you're going to get their attention. Anyone who says that to me, I'm like, really? Oh my. <laughs> it's just basic ego stuff. It works. And it's authentic, right? If you actually mean what you say, but if you start in, in a complimentary way, you're going to get folks' attention because if you're not in their district and it's not an issue that there seems to be a priority subject to them, you got to have that hook. And if you don't have a personal connection or some other connection, so I know I'm being recorded, so now it's forever. Seth Groves knows that I like him. I do. Like, I, he's just, he's a funny guy, he's a nice guy. We do not share a political ideology, but I believe he believes in a robust deliver. I know he believes in a robust conversation and not all of his colleagues uh, uh, have that value, even though they may have a similar political ideology. And you have to use that because that's meaningful. You got to start where people are. So that's what I think um, 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 is how you should use me. And because there are other names on this bill, remember I brought in nine of my colleagues, you can ask them to do some of the legwork too, particularly uh, Representative Kenyatta, who is um, a member of state government committee. So, um, and there may be others but I'll let you look and um, um, I don't have that in front of me right now, but there may be other members of state government who are co-prime sponsors of the bill. Um, so yeah, I, I, and Alicia, if you hadn't um, accidentally hit that button, I, I would have forgotten to mention that. And I think, I think that's an important thing for your future uh, uh, mobilizing efforts. Thank you very much. Um, Barbara, do you have, um, are you going to wrap it up, Barbara, or? Barbara, you're muted. Um, how about taking one more question? Uh, and anybody have a pressing question before we close the meeting? Um, I have a pressing point to make. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to remind people, and maybe Eileen can take one minute to talk about our organization, but there is a national popular vote organization that has tons of information and tools for those of you who are inspired and want to start actually taking action on this. Um, so if you don't mind my putting you on this spot, Eileen, maybe you could talk for a second about your organization. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you so much, uh, Representative Rob. It's been great to hear you speak about this. Um, so national popular vote, we uh, want to support folks like yourselves all across the country that are advocating for this, uh, especially from the grassroots perspective. So if you want to get involved, you can sign up at nationalpopularvote.com volunteer, 
We have monthly meetings just with folks in Pennsylvania to talk about the status of the bill, what organizing we can do, how we can work together to call for action and change, and especially as we get a little bit closer to hopefully doing in-person events again soon. Um, and we also have a lot of training materials. Um, I do regular webinars where we go over how to talk about the bill, how to answer the most frequent questions that come up if you're giving a presentation, kind of what the general you know, advice is and do's and don'ts for meeting with legislators and, and really framing this in a pro-democracy way, um, as the representative was saying. So all of that is on our website at nationalpopularvote.com. Um, and I'll just plug, you can always write your legislator and you can share this link anywhere. Um, nationalpopularvote.com slash PA will link people directly to a, a form where they can write their legislator and customize their message to take action on this as well as a, a quick way that you can do something right before you get off of this call. So thank you all so much for your interest in this. And I, I hope to see lots of you advocating for, for this in Harrisburg in the future. Me too. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there were several comments uh, thanking our uh, speakers for their contributions and for the lesson on how the state government works. You know, what an eye opener. Yes, I want to thank you both. I feel like we've just had a master class in advocacy and lobbying. I think I've been in the league for, you know, what is it now, like eight years? And I think this was the best uh instructional experience on how to become an effective lobbyist you explain the the uh complexity of how bills get through the system and why they get stopped i never totally understood that why they just sort of get out there in the abyss and don't move so i really appreciate you doing this for us it was fabulous and i'm so happy we have it as a recording so that other people can uh, watch it and learn from it as well so thank you very much. It's, it was a fabulous presentation. Thank you, Brett, too, for sharing uh, what the league has done on it. And uh, we really appreciate it. And we hope we, we can be working together in the future. You all know where to find me. You found me the first time. Keep using me now, keep showing up. I really, really appreciate your time and your collective effort. This is how we're gonna get anything meaningful done by working together. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.